Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook webinar presented by NDSU Extension. My name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist working in bioenergy, and I moderate uh, webinars uh, most months of the year. Uh, this, this month, things will going to be a little bit different uh, due to a, another obligation. We are going to take questions for uh, Frayne Olson immediately after his presentation. Um, but other than that, we'll save questions towards the end. So if you do have a question for Frayne that comes up, uh, please, please ask that when he's finished with his prepared remarks. Uh, and of course, too, if you have questions afterwards, you can, you can reach out to any of us uh, in the future uh, to address those. Uh, we do have a Q&A tool. This is the webinar platform of Zoom, and we ask that you use that. Um, it, you can also use the chat. We, we know how to operate that as well, but we ask that you use the Q&A if at all possible. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Brian Parman. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, so today I'm, I'm kind of stepping off the, the ag platform a little bit and just generally talking about inflation. And the, the biggest reason for that is it's been in the news a lot. It's been in the news all summer, a lot of concerns about inflation, uh, headline grabbing sound bites and, and sentences that, that folks in the government and at the Fed and, and uh, financial analysts have made. So uh, the fir you know, my first slide here, where I just kind of title it headlines, um, it basically, th these are kind of the things that we're seeing, right? And, and there was a report, and part of the reason I'm also covering this, a, re a report came out yesterday, and one of the headlines from CNBC was uh, consumer prices jumped 5.4%. Uh, but core inflation rises less than expected. So you might have seen that yesterday the stock market rallied a little bit and saw a little bit of bump. Essentially, um, most of most folks in the market were expecting a bigger jump than inflation than than actually happened. Uh, and so we we saw the stock market increase. Now, why does that happen? Well, because even though there was inflation, the the thought process is that it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. And that may keep the Fed on track to keep interest rates low. So then the, then the market rallies. And then, you know, July data reveals significant cooling in transitory inflation. And here kind of at the end of this talk, I'll hit on transitory versus uh, kind of a, I hate to call it permanent because nothing's really permanent, but a more uh, lasting inflation. And then a uh, final headline from the Wall Street Journal, inflation stayed high in July as the economy rebounded. Um, you know, these were these were basically the headlines that were grabbed uh, from the July report that came out yesterday morning. So my first slide comes uh, with that's a chart comes from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. People will call it the BLS. And what this shows is how prices changed relative to the month before. This is not an annual inflation rate. Uh, what it's showing is how much higher were prices, let's say this month than they were last month. OK. And so we see over on the right of the chart, you'll see the year is on the bottom. Uh, I know it says month, but then the, the numbers that it shows are the years. But uh, you see that there was this big, right at the start of 2020, uh, actual deflation. Uh, that was the pandemic, the, the start of the pandemic, March and April, where prices actually dropped. Then we had a, a rebound in inflation there toward the end of the year. And over on the right, you can see that prices have been, you know, half a percent approaching 1% higher month over month for the last several months. And this is the inflation that folks are talking about that every month prices have been slightly higher than they were last month. And you can see on this time horizon of 2004, we see prices mostly higher than zero relative to the previous month. We did have big deflation, uh, even bigger deflation than we had in the pandemic following the uh, financial crisis. And the biggest reason for that is actually because housing and shelter is a big component of inflation when they calculate this. And when the housing bubble burst and home prices cratered, well, it showed very strong deflation or very high deflation, a very high negative number. Uh, and that was because of uh, housing being a big part of um, the inflation calculation and it dropping significantly. So my next slide just zooms in on the same chart. It's uh, instead of looking at it from 2004, we're looking at it from January of 2020. And you see that deflationary period there in March and April, kind of toward the end of February, March and April on the left, that's that line below zero. And then, uh, then that rebound toward uh, the summer in Q3, 
uh, relatively low inflation. And then again, picking up this year, uh, in, uh, price changes since March above 5% uh, every month. Now, this isn't the yearly inflation rate. You'll see like in that last headline uh, on one of the headlines I showed, it said 5.5% inflation. What they've done there is annualized it. They've said, you know, what would the rate be if these price increases month over month at say 4.5%, 5%, what would that be for an annual inflation rate? And I'm going to show some of that here in a second. So when you look at these, these are just month versus month changes. The price, for instance, uh, in July was approximately, if all the way to the right is July, was approximately 5% higher than it was in June. That's, that's how you read this. But significantly higher than it's been uh, for the last several years. And that's what's grabbed a lot of folks' attention. So my next slide shows that annualized inflation rate I was just saying where they take the year, uh, uh, instead of having a monthly inflation rate, how much did prices rise uh, this year or whatever year compared to the year before? And so far, I, I, I highlight the 5.4, that's the projected inflation rate for 2021. In other words, taking what's already happened and what's expected to happen in the coming months, uh, an inflation rate of 5.4%, which is high. By, by any metric, 5.4% or by any standard that we use in the US, 5.4% uh, is very high. In fact, the last time it was even close to that high in one year was around 2008 when it was 3.8%. Typically, the Federal Reserve likes to see that inflation rate closer to 2%. So this would be you know, over double, uh, two, and, two and a half times at least what, what they would actually like to see uh, for an inflation rate. So. Yes, 5.4% is high, it's higher than, and that's why you're seeing a lot of this stuff in the news, okay? Now, my next slide, I just kind of want to talk about some things that don't get brought up very much. We hear terms like transitory inflation and economic rebound causing inflation and, and the Federal Reserve's actions causing inflation and government spending causing inflation. All, a lot of, all of that stuff is essentially true but what the, the hardest part is disentangling one from the other or cause and effect, what, what's actually going on. And I just want to highlight to anyone who maybe isn't really familiar, th this is a little bit of an oversimplification or, or generalization, but there's essentially two reasons for inflation in an economy, okay? The first one is, is sort of a natural inflationary phenomenon, and that would be your supply and demand driven inflation. So either there is a shortage of products for whatever reason, so that would be a supply side uh, inflationary impact. Uh, for instance, if there's a high demand for lumber for whatever reason, uh, uh, everybody in the economy decides they wanna do home improvement repairs next month and there's a big lumber shortage, well, that's a, that would be kind of a, a, both a demand, a demand driven inflationary uh, uh, reason or there's a supply side like with a drought, for instance, in agriculture where maybe demand doesn't change much, there's still the same demand for corn or the same demand for soybean around the world, but because of drought, there's less of it. So the price winds up going up. Those are your pretty much traditional supply and demand uh, driven inflation. And, and it is inflation nonetheless, prices went up uh, and, and it, the cause is just different. The, and, and then again, the other one was a significant shift in demand. That would be my example on a, on a, a lumber that we actually saw. So I took that kind of example from, from what, what actually happened was during the pandemic, you had people wanting to do home improvement repairs. You had a significant portion of the economy who, uh, uh, after being in lockdowns and dealing with some of the things that the larger met metropolitan areas and cities had to deal with, they wanted to move out into the suburbs. So they had more space after being locked down for several months. So you have all these people rushing out to buy homes or build homes and then do home improvement projects. And so the demand for lumber kind of skyrocketed whereas supply stayed fixed. And so we saw this big rise in prices and in, in lumber prices and home prices and everything else. Okay, and, and in these cases, usually that inflationary impact is going to be somewhat isolated, right? It's, it's not gonna necessarily be widespread. You may not see a drought which causes a big spike, let's say in corn and soybean prices have a big, uh, a big impact on microchips, for instance. Okay, now the next reason for inflation is change, the, the next general reason would be a policy change or a change in the money supply, a change in the behavior of the uh, Federal Reserve, for instance. And then this one is the one that a, a lot of folks are worried about and wouldn't be as much of a transitory inflationary 
uh, cause, and that is, you know, injections of dollars into the money supply causing more dollars to be in the economy and therefore prices rising. Essentially to the, to the consumer, the value of the product, the intrinsic value, the utility that the consumer gets from the product hasn't changed. It's just that there's a lot more money in, in, in the money supply so that it costs more dollars to do it. In other words, the, buy, the overall buying power of the dollar has declined. And in this case, most of the time, you'll see the price impacts be felt across just near most, most, if not all goods, instead of just a few goods here and there causing the inflation spikes, okay? So my next slide, I, I wanna show a quote from the uh, Fed, uh, Fed chair, uh, Jerome Powell. And you know, he says the concept of transitory is, uh, is really this, it is that the increase will happen or increases will happen, but we're not saying that uh, the prices will reverse, that, that, that the transitory uh, changes in inflation will be temporary. It, it's just that, or that the, basically what he's saying here is he's not saying prices are now gonna go down. He's saying that the gain in prices or the rapid appreciation of prices will subside that will come up to this new, more permanent price plateau for a lot of these goods, and then that's where it'll stay. So they, they're not saying that producer, that, that suddenly the lumber prices are going to crater or home prices are all of a sudden gonna go down 10%, just that they're not going to appreciate at the rate that they have been. And then this transitory concept is, is more like, if you think about, you've got this pressurized champagne bottle and somebody took the cork off, all the champagne comes, spilling out because there's all this built up demand from the pandemic. Uh, again, using that home value thing for an example, that once all the folks who lived in the uh, uh, multifamily living areas and things like that in the cities and everybody who gets their home purchased or built that wanted to, you're gonna go back to a more natural two to 3% increase in home values rather than this big rampant increase. Or for instance, the increase in used car values and even new car values that's happened due to some shortages in, in certain components, that once that once that situation's resolved, you're gonna see just going back to a small incremental increase or appreciation in those prices rather than the big jumps that have happened. That's kind of what they mean by this transitory period is that coming out of a pandemic, economy getting back on its feet, there's inflation here and there where we've got these supply bottlenecks and issues, but once those resolve, it's more of a normal or natural rate of inflation uh, or one that the Fed is targeting at that closer to two to 3% uh, um, rate. But uh, my next slide kind of shows that there is a little bit of disagreement on that and some inflationary uh, uh, observations persist, uh, even in the July report that the cost of rent rose 2.4% compared to last year, shelter, which that's why I said with those new how those home prices and stuff cratering showed that big deflation. The cost of shelter accounts for over a third of inflation rose 2.8% year over year, and it's been kind of sticky. So, and then we, we saw that prices at restaurants and bars uh, remained high with a monthly increase. So not annualized monthly of 0.8% uh, to uh, compared to like 0.7 and 0.6% the month before. So uh, food prices and beverage prices and things like that at, at bars and restaurants actually remain sticky and fairly high. And again, that food and uh, uh, energy are not part of the core inflation, but those are expenses that people incur and real expenses that people see, even though they tend to be a little bit more volatile. So my next slide, uh, folks may wonder how the Federal Reserve um, can halt inflation. Are there actions that they can take to halt inflation? And there absolutely is. Uh, you know, we've got government spending on one side, which injects uh, a lot of money into the economy, but there's actions that the, the Fed can take to halt inflation and they have taken in the past. And essentially the Fed halts inflation by, by selling bonds. So they sell you a bond, they sell a bond of any kind, and that takes money out of the economy and it's, and it's held at the Federal Reserve essentially. So that's less dollars to circulate in the economy. And, and we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars here that they could potentially pull out. And that would uh, reduce the supply of dollars, keeping the demand for dollars the same. And that's going to drive up interest rates. It's gonna drive up the federal funds rate. And the other thing it's going to do is if they're selling uh, large quantities of bonds, for instance, and they're not buying, for instance, US treasuries, 
Well, then the rate that has to be offered in order to get all these treasuries bought up, either being newly issued ones or on the secondary market, the rate being offered on them has to go up to entice new buyers to come into the market and buy it, thereby again driving up interest rates. So when that happens and this, the, the dollars are taken out of the, of the general economy and as the rates are driven up, that tends to halt inflation. Um, and, and depending on how high they drive them up and how far and how long uh, can have a real strong impact on inflation in somewhat a very short period of time. Okay, so this next slide, and it's my, my last graph slide, I promise, uh, actually shows that, uh, that happening. So here, if anyone remembers the 1980s, well, let's go back to the 1970s. They had that period under uh, Jimmy Carter where they called the stagflation years. You had a stagnant economy, basically, and this high inflation rate. Well, the Fed chairman then in the 1980s, Paul Volcker, he adopted a policy where they were going to uh, uh, tighten the money supply at the Federal Reserve, um, and it drove in interest rates up extremely high there in the early 80s. And this is the federal funds rate, but I, I know a lot of you folks remember who've been on here uh, uh, and been at this a long time, interest rates in the 80s up around 20%, 22%. That absolutely did it, it caused a recession, but it also stone cold stopped inflation right there in its tracks. I mean, it's a painful, it's a painful process and a painful way to do it, but it can be done and it has been done in the past. And that's sort of the actions that would be taken and what folks are afraid of. Now, I'm not saying the Fed's going to, in the near future, jack rates up to 20% again. Uh, if, if they have to, but that, and then, and that's sort of the fears that, that some of these folks uh, in the markets are having is, how are they going to react if these inflationary numbers persist? The market's a little bit nervous and they hang on every word that comes out of the Fed's mouth to try to see how long are they going to keep rates at zero and how long will they allow this, this inflation to continue before they start raising rates to try to curb it. And, and really the question is, do they believe that this inflation is a result of, say, a lot of the spending that's, that's been undertaking and the, and the Fed's most recent policies of, of quantitative easing? Or do they think it's just a, a blip from the, the economy reopening and pent up demand and some supply chain bottlenecks trying to catch up with it? And in the, in the next quarter or two, these, in, these five and 6% inflationary projections are going to drop. And therefore the Fed believe that you know, they should go ahead and stay the course. And that's really what it boils down to, which one of these is true. And, and, and it's a tough guess on their part and, and as I was told, you know, going to school, that Fed policies are more like steering a ship than, than driving a sports car. Uh, you have to start turning long before the corner uh, in order to uh, get your ship on the right track. And that's with a lot of these Fed policies that they undertake is it can take months, quarters, half a year before, their pol before we can go back and analyze was their policy the correct one and is, is it actually working? So that's why there's a lot of guesswork here and why folks in the market are are doing the best they can to try to predict what the Fed's actually going to do and how is that going to impact consumer prices, uh, company values, things like that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to this. If you have any questions on it, I'll try my best to answer it. It's a really complicated topic. In some ways it's complicated, in some ways it's very simple, but there again, you know, there's a lot of folks out there trying to project what's happening and what will happen in the future and that's why you see a lot of conflicting um, cases and statements on, on what's going on with inflation and what, what the government's reaction should be to it is, do you believe it's transitory or do you believe that this is just a reaction to this big increase in the money supply and quantitative easing? And as a result, that the, the, that the government needs to take action immediately to try, try to curb it. So I, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Frayne Olson and uh, Frayne, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, so I'm Fran Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist. This is my contact information. Um, I, again, as, as David said, I do have another conference that I'm attending right now and I'll be speaking in uh, about an hour. So I need to uh, get kind of organized and prep for that as well. But I'll go through kind of the implications of the USDA uh, WASD report and production report that we got a couple hours ago. Um, if you do have any questions, you know, please be sure to try and tap them type them into the uh, Q&A function. I'll try and answer them today. 
Uh, if there's something that comes up later, don't feel, don't hesitate to reach out and try and contact me at some time in the future. So uh, just to summarize my first slide, uh, the key numbers, these are kind of the key numbers that, that everybody's going to jump to first. So let me explain in the August report, it's the first time that USDA, instead of using a trend line yield estimate, where they're looking at kind of historically, what do we see and picking an average number, they actually look at current growing conditions, current crop conditions, and try and estimate or forecast what the final yield will be. Now, uh, I'll go through in a little bit how they get these numbers, uh, but these are the numbers that are in the marketplace right now. These are the numbers people are trading off of. And until we get the September report, these will likely be the numbers that most traders and analysts will use. So the top row on the very top, what I said, average trade estimates. So before each of these crop reports, the major news agencies like uh, Bloomberg and Reuters and Wall Street Journal um, will we'll do survey of private analysts, private forecasters and say, what do you expect USDA to come out with? What do you think the number will be? And, and that is kind of the, the number that people are trading into the report. Now, once we get the report, obviously they say, well, how did, what did, what happened? I expected this number to be this. It was actually a different number. So the two things, the two first numbers people jumped to was the corn and soybean yield because they have now formally been updated based on best expectations for the current growing conditions, not necessarily a trend line yield. Um, so if you notice the corn yield in the very bottom row that you highlighted in red, that was the number that we got a couple hours ago. The trade was expecting about 177 and a half. We actually got 174 and a half. So lower than what we were expecting. And as a result, then when you do the math on well, here's what our average yield per harvested acreage acre is. You take that times harvested acreage, you can get a, 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 an estimate of what the total production will be. So again, going into the report, we were expecting about a 15 billion bushel crop. Uh, right now, the current expectations is for something a little less than 15 billion bushels. On the soybean side, the adjustment wasn't quite as large. The, 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 the difference between what the trade is expecting to see and what we actually got wasn't as large, but it was still definitely towards the low end of the range. So if you look at the range of what the highest estimate was versus the lowest estimate, you'll notice this 50 bushel per acre is towards the low end of what the trade was expecting to see. And again, as a result, um, our, our production numbers for soybeans were relatively small compared to what the trade was expecting. Not, not seismic differences, but enough difference that it really put a lift into the marketplace today, especially for corn. So on my next slide, we had the same updated information now for the wheat complex. And the wheat complex gets more complicated because we have not only all wheat, which is all the wheat production blended together, but we have these different classes. And again, this is one of the reasons that the, the winter wheat market today is, is responding fairly positively, is if you look at that top row, which is the average trade estimate versus what the bottom row is, the actual number coming out of the USDA updates, we see that there are some differences. On total wheat numbers, they were down a little bit, but again, not dramatically. But if we go class by class by class, we did see some changes. And the biggest change between what the trade was expecting versus what we actually got uh, was really in the hard red winter wheat complex. Uh, they were expecting about 860 million bushels total production. We got 775 or 777 million bushels. Now, again, that's the, the price rise we saw today in, in, in wheat, in the wheat complex was a combination of a little bit tighter supply demand conditions on the wheat complex. But more importantly, we saw a pretty dramatic drop and tightening of that corn complex. And wheat is an alternative feed source. So uh, the wheats, the, the milling wheats we grow in the United States has to stay at a premium to corn to prevent all, too much of the corn of the wheat, wheat crop, excuse me, to go into the feed supplies as a substitute for corn. Um, on the spring wheat side, there was a slight uh, increase uh, uh, higher and again primarily because of a slight revision upward in the spring wheat yield for North Dakota. Again, not dramatic changes, but they were there was enough changes that the, the market was paying attention. So on our next slide, it shows 
the forecast for ending stocks. So this is both the inbound supply side, the production, our imports plus carryover stocks, less our expected or forecasted usage levels. So how much are we going to consume over the next 12 months? Again, you look at the top row, which is what the average trade estimate is relative to the bottom row, which is what we got from USDA today. Um, and you'll notice that in particular on both wheat and more importantly, corn, those ending stocks numbers, the number we were expecting to see relative to we got, what we got this, this uh, a couple hours ago, were, were a bit larger than I think most traders were expecting. So again, uh, relatively neutral for soybeans, but positive for corn and tightening up and positive for wheat as well. On the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about how does USDA come up with these yield estimates, in particular for corn and soybeans. It's a combination of two primary sources of information or data. One is a farmer survey. It's actually a survey of farm operators. They literally call up about 18,600 farmers across the United States and say, look, given what you see today and normal or typical uh, temperatures and precipitation from here forward, what do you think the yields on your farm will be? They combine that information with satellite imagery. And again, USDA has been using satellite imagery for you know, 20 plus years. Um, and they've got forecasting models based on, uh, for, in, for example, NDVI, the, the vegetative index, the vegetative health. And they try and estimate or forecast what the yield and yield potential might be for crops in this re in, uh, under surveillance or under kind of observation. Now for corn and soybeans, we won't get what they call objective yield surveys where they actually send uh, people out into the country and, and actually do a, 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 a boots on the ground kind of yield estimate, very similar to what a crop insurance adjuster would do. We won't get that information blended into this forecast until September. So we have two, two major sources of information in, in August. We'll have a third in the September report. Now the key and one of the, one of the reasons you see, can see fairly dramatic differences between what USDA is forecasting for a yield versus what you're seeing some of the private analysts coming out with in their individual reports is when USDA puts this information together, when they're forecasting yields, either through remote sensing or when they ask farmers, they're very specific to say, assuming that we have normal temperatures and normal precipitation from today until harvest. Now, obviously, especially in the Western Corn Belt, where we have uh, drought conditions, um, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of the extended forecast and what we might be looking for. And everybody knows, at least in the Western, Western Corn Belt, you know, we're in a drought, that drought isn't gonna turn around really, really quickly. But from, from a USDA procedure standpoint, this is the procedure they have every year. So you will see some differences between what USDA is forecasting versus what a lot of private analysts were, are forecasting, primarily because about their expectations regarding weather going forward. On my next slide, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the reliability of the yield forecast coming out of this August report. So I, I'm giving you some background information so that you can put some of this into context. Um, now, the, the markets, traders and analysts will trade information or trade on expectations for the number that USDA gave, but recognize we have a range. And at the end of each of these reports, there's a, and nobody reads them because it's in kind of the footnotes portion of, the, of these reports, USDA does track and say, well, how reliable is our forecast in August now compared to the final number we get in January, which is kind of the final official numbers. And so they have two different ways of tracking that. Number one is, well, is the August number higher or lower than the, 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 the actual? How many years are the, is our forecast too high and how many years are the forecast too low? as well as they put a statistical confidence interval. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to give a, a reference point for, for how reliable or how accurate is the corn and soybean as well as wheat yield forecasts out of this August report versus what the final numbers are. So for corn, that first bullet point for, for August corn yield forecasts, when we compare it to what was forecasted versus the actual numbers, out of the last 20 years, we usually use 20 years of data, nine years, the August report was too low, and 11 years, the August report was too high. 
So, you know, that's actually pretty close to a 50-50 split. So we got a kind of a 50-50 chance of being a little higher, a little lower based on what we see today. The other thing is this confidence interval. And I don't want to go through, again, a lot of the mathematical details other than to say USDA's estimate today was 174.6. And we can put a range around that. And we're saying, well, 90% of the time, or we're 90% confident that the real number, the actual January final report number that we get will be somewhere between about 163 and 186. Now you look at it and say, well, that's pretty wide range and it is, but if you remember back to your kind of basic statistics, that nice bell shaped curve that your, 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 your math teacher always talked about. So we're looking at a pretty wide range of saying when we're 90% confident that the actual yield will be someplace in between there. And, and what I'm saying is as we move through time, that confidence interval will become narrow and narrow and narrow. So we're going to be more and more confident that the number we see in the report is going to be close to the actual number. I'm just wanting to emphasize that we do have this range of possible outcomes depending upon what happens. And this is based off of history. We shift to soybeans, which is on the bottom. And soybeans is a little bit different because August is such a critical time period for uh, soybean yields and soybean development, especially in the United States. You know, weather and, and precipitation in August can make a huge difference on flowering and pod set and the number of seeds per pod. So when we look historically, you look at the August soybean yield estimate versus the final, there's about 14 years out of the last 20 where the August report showed too low a number. That as we moved into harvest, that yield estimate actually started to increase a little bit. There's about six years out of 20 where the August number was a little too high and it kind of ratcheted down. So again, looking at the confidence interval, if you notice the confidence interval is a little higher. So we got more variability at this time of year. We've got more uncertainty about what the final yield is going to be. Now USDA came out with 50. They're saying, look, there's about 90% chance that the real number will be somewhere between 45 and 55. Now in the world of soybeans and given the very, very tight supplies on soybeans, Again, that's a really, really wide range. The reason I want to bring this up is to say we still have a lot of uncertainty. We're, we still got a lot of growing season left, and we have to be aware of that. So don't put too much pressure on these estimates for corn and soybeans. The next slide, I do the same thing with spring wheat and spring wheat specifically. Okay, so again, we're looking back the last 20 years. Um, there's about 11 years out of 20 where the August number is a little too low. There's about nine years where it's a little bit too high relative to the, the final numbers. So again, about a 50-50 split. Also notice the confidence interval. So one of the challenges we have with spring wheat is, yeah, this year we're pretty much wrapping up harvest. We're kind of on the backside of, of the peak harvest for wheat, mainly because of the drought and we had early plantings and everything's pushed along. But you guys also remember, we have quite a few years where we're in the middle of August and, and for spring wheat harvest hasn't really even kicked in yet. So I, I do think that based on history, that's kind of wide. We're zeroing in on kind of the final number, um, the 30.6 bushels per acre, I guess, in my personal opinion, hearing some of the harvest reports, the fact that we're getting a little bit better test weights than we had originally expected given a drought year. You know, for spring wheat, um, I think that's probably a pretty close number. Might be a, a smidge too high, but I, I do think it's very, very close to the final number. Personal opinion. Okay, moving on, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about weather and what to expect. Now, one of the challenges for corn and soybeans is we have this tale of two cities. What's going on in the Western Corn Belt versus the Eastern Corn Belt are very, very different. So in the Midwest, we usually use the Mississippi River as kind of that dividing line, imaginary line between the Western Corn Belt and the Eastern Corn Belt. So if you look at the Mississippi River, which is that dividing, dividing line between Iowa and Illinois, between Missouri and Illinois and Kentucky, you just move down, that's the Mississippi River. So let's look at the Western Corn Belt. And there's a lot of corn acres in the Western Corn Belt. Iowa is one, Iowa, Southern Minnesota, South Dakota, even into Nebraska. I've talked about this before. Those are some really key corn growing regions as well as soybean growing regions. And the market's watching that very, very closely. Now this is the drought monitor map that was released this morning. 
tried to provide some updates. Let's compare that to the Eastern Corn Belt. I'm gonna have some more soil moisture as well as kind of precipitation numbers coming up in a minute. The Eastern Corn Belt, I've talked to some farmers in Illinois. Um, next week, we're gonna have an extension conference where we bring in some of the uh, state specialists, people that have positions like myself and Tim to talk about what's going on nationally. And I expect to hear some very, very big yield reports, at least expected yield reports for corn and beans coming out of the Eastern Corn Belt. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, um, into Eastern Kansas and Oklahoma. That area has had a lot of rainfall. They've had the extra heat. You know, the crop is looking really great. So the reason I say there's this kind of tale of two cities is that we've got yield decreases that are, are appearing now and, and becoming known in the Western Corn Belt but we've got above average yields expected for the Eastern Corn Belt. So the real question and the struggle for the marketplace right now is, well, will the extra bushels in the Eastern Corn Belt offset the reductions we're seeing in the Western Corn Belt? And again, this is gonna be hotly debated as, as, as we go through the rest of the marketing year. So I do expect continued volatility in the corn and soybean markets. Now the drought monitor map I show here, right here, the simplest way to think about it is, how much moisture is in that full soil profile. So we're also looking at kind of irrigation wells and what's happening to our subsoil moisture levels. On my next slide, I tried to find some information on the soil moisture content at more of the root zone. So what, what are the crops experiencing? Now this, again, I pulled this this morning. Um, this is updated on a daily basis. And yes, it's computer generated estimates based off of rainfall, evapotranspiration, a lot of, they got big long formulas, they try and estimate this. So I don't wanna push this too hard, but it does kind of help us understand what's going on. So this is the, an estimate of the soil moisture between about four inches and about 16 inches. So we're looking, we're not looking at the so, whole soil profile, we're looking at kind of that lower root zone and saying, well, how much moisture is there today relative to normal? So if we look at the scaling on the bottom and we look at those dark grays, we're saying, look, relative to normal, those, those lower level root zone uh, soil moisture, at least again in the Western Corn Belt is exceptionally dry. Not a big surprise to anybody probably listening. What I do want you to focus on though is what's happening in that Eastern Corn Belt. So we're now reaching the time and the growth stages where corn and soybeans start to demand a lot of moisture. They need a lot of, of, of energy and water to be able to put as much energy into the producing a seed as possible. So we do see in the root zone that we see that these areas, as I mentioned before, in uh, Missouri and Iowa, I mean, excuse me, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, that yeah, they've got some, they've been getting rains, but there are relative to normal, relative to average or typical, we are a little bit on the dry side. Now, and this is not at critical levels yet, but it is again, something to watch very, very closely. And so, as I said, looking forward, we're gonna be watching the weather forecasts extremely uh, uh, closely. The next slide is basically the same map, but it's for that top uh, zero to four inches. So now really looking at surface moisture. So before it was more deeper in the root zone, this is a little bit higher to the surface level. And again, depending upon the crop that you're growing and, and, and where the root zone goes within the soil profile, these will tell slightly different stories. So you look at the Western Corn Belt, um, Southern Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, again, very dry. You get into the Eastern Corn Belt, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, even if you look uh, at Wisconsin, which is a big corn growing state, although I know they chop a lot of that corn for corn silage, uh, but they still do quite a bit of corn and some soybeans into even into Michigan. Uh, Michigan does a lot of soybeans. You know, that surface moisture, those top zero to four inches, again, that it's a little bit dry relative to normal, but it's still well within that normal range. So if we get some additional rain showers, there, there is this yield potential that we can see from that Eastern Corn Belt. Next slide, please. So when we look forward, and I just pulled this again this morning with the six to 10 day precipitation forecast. 
So we're looking kind of the extended forecast. What do we expect to see over the next six to 10 day time period when it comes to precipitation? Now, this is all about odds. Um, this is all about probabilities. And what they're saying is, look, when we look at North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, um, you know, this kind of driest area, it looks as though we have a pretty good probability of above average rainfall. Now, I want to be careful because in August, what's our typical rainfall amounts in North Dakota? They do tend to be lower. So we got to be a little careful about reading the implications for this. But over the six to 10 day period, it looks like, well, you know, this, this um, Western Corn Belt might get some above average precipitation for this type of year. That's, there are very good odds of that. We look at the Eastern Corn Belt, um, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, et cetera. They're looking at saying, well, it'll probably be normal. Now, normal rainfall in Illinois and Iowa at this time of the year is still pretty good rainfall. So we're looking at either uh, average or slightly above average precipitation. The next slide is the same thing for temperatures. Now, this is the thing that, again, as we get into uh, pollination for corn, we get into flowering and pod set and, and seed development for soybeans. You know, heat is one of our enemies at this stage of the game. So again, there's some concern about looking at the uh, probability, the odds of above average temperatures as we get into both the Western Corn Belt as well as the Eastern Corn Belt. You know, the heat is on. And again, the debate will be, so even though we might have some, some moisture coming in with this higher temperatures, above average temperatures, what does that really mean for our yield and yield potential? Again, that's the reason we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about not only what's happening right now, but what's our weather forecasts. So I believe that's my last slide. If I, yep, and I will hand things over. Well, actually, are there any questions that have come in? Because again, as I mentioned, I'm, at, I'm attending another conference. I need to be speaking um, shortly here. So I will have to drop offline uh, once I conclude. So if there's an emergency or an immediate question, I'd be happy to answer that. If not, I'll hand things over to Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, uh, Brian mentioned supply and demand and the money supply and so on. And so uh, obviously livestock prices and talk most of the time about cattle supply and demand are the two things that affect prices too. And so first of all, I would just wanna go through some supply uh, issues for cattle because we've had a recent update on uh, July 23rd, USDA released the semi-annual cattle inventory report. Uh, this is report in July is not as in, in, involved as the January 1st report that's state by state and so on. This is just a, a, a lower survey and just an estimate for the total US and not state by state. So we can't look at drought related issues and so on. But anyway, uh, the, we were expecting lower cattle numbers again this year and that's what we got. You see, the, I'm not gonna go through all the numbers there. On the right hand side, you see the year over year changes and the red numbers mean that the numbers went down. So the key ones there are where the purple arrows are, beef cows were about down 2%. And uh, the next one down, be looking ahead, is what the cow number is going to be in the next year. Our beef replacement heifers down 2.3%. You know, from uh, a price standpoint, then go down to the feeder calf supply. The third arrow down there would have 1.6% uh, fewer feeder cattle than we had last year at this time. So all of those obviously are supportive to prices into the future with lower supply. So go to the next slide. Uh, this just puts it in a longer run perspective and what's been happening, the decline this year in beef cow numbers was uh, nothing new. This now is the third year of decline after a rapid buildup since uh, those low numbers back there, uh, the, the lowest is that uh, dashed line at the bottom of the chart there in 2014. And then we had a rapid buildup and have backed off a little bit. The big question is, what will they be next year? And again, you saw the beef replacement efforts frame showed you the drought map over half the 
beef cow herd is in an area with drought. And so it's very, very likely that numbers will decline again in 2022. Uh, USDA in the WASDE report today is, is uh, forecasting lower beef production next year and probably the next year. So again, the, those are supportive to prices. So go to the next slide. Uh, you know, here are the beef replacement heifers. And, uh, and, you know, I said they were down here in 2021, and they've been declining here the last several years, but go back, we've got the lowest number of replacement heifers that we had since that severe drought in the southern plains back in 2010, in particular 11, 12 and 13. That's kind of what drought does and, and, and we keep less replacement heifers and we reduce the herd back then. So just another indication that the, the beef cow herd is probably going to decline again. So go to the next slide. Uh, so lower, well, again, prices are affected by two things, that's supply and demand. So for sure, we're going to have lower supplies. And uh, on the demand side, I covered that more last time. And, and Brian pretty well covered this for uh, on the demand side, we have domestic demand and export demand. And uh, the domestic demand is soaring, like he said, and prices are going up and maybe some worry about inflation. The stock market was record high yesterday. So uh, a, a lot of good expectations for uh, the, the uh, domestic demand. But any so anyway, you put of uh, very good demand and lower supplies together, you get higher prices. So here's fed cattle, the red line is what they've been doing this year, gradually increasing with the, just a little stalling out here in the summer when they're usually seasonally low in the summer, they're actually at the kind of the highest levels uh, for the year, but stalled out about the last month. But those red squares then are the futures market, which usually prices do increase after the summer. And so uh, the futures market therefore, uh, you know, by the end of the year is up to 133. That's, and for the rest of the year now, as a matter of fact, prices are higher than they have been. The last three years is on the chart. 2018 is the blue, green 19, purple 2020 were quite a bit higher. And, and uh, expectations are to continue higher, again, based on the strong demand and the shorter supplies. The further out we go will be the shorter supplies. The Fed's cattle are the, the furthest out to show the lower supplies because you know the calf crop is lower and then it takes a year or so to feed them out or so on. And then importantly, go to 2022 futures, you see even higher again, again, based on the strong demand and the, the uh, lower supplies there by April of 2022, up to 140. And again, throughout the year, December 140. If that materializes and fed cattle prices in 2022 are at 140, that will be the highest monthly prices since August of 2015 when we hit 140. So we got to go back uh, all the way to 2015. And uh, of course, the record highs were in 2014. So a lot of optimism for prices at the present time. Go to the next slide. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about more exports because just last Friday, the USDA released their exports. Again, I already talked about domestic demand and, and Brian did. We are at record export levels for beef exports. See, we backed off a little bit in June, mainly because we had very, very high prices in the US, but we're still at record levels on a volume basis. And we expect that to continue again throughout the year. On the bottom chart is then the value. The value is important. That's in, in dollars then. And uh, the actually the dollar amount did not back off as much as the volume did on the top uh, percentage wise simply because we had uh, really high prices and June is the is the last information that we have so again the export market is doing well go to the next slide uh, here then I'll get a lot of questions about where do our beef exports go? And so I need to move along here, but you know, the red line on the top is Japan. They have been and continue to be our, our best customer. The green line second there is South Korea that went from our fourth best customer back in 2014 up to our second best customer. And even in a couple months here, they've been our 
our uh, best customer uh, topping Japan. So doing very well into Korea. Then the big one on the bottom, I have circled uh, China there in the yellow. And you see China was you know, very low up until about 2019. They went to about our 10th best customer and last year about our seventh best customer. And this year, uh, actually in June, they were our second best customer, even a little above Korea. The red line isn't showing up there because Korea is right over the red line. Japan was still number one, but a very, very close second with China. So uh, the phase one agreement with China mid-year last year has really kicked in. The 30-month requirement was waived uh, for beef. And so we can get all and a lot of other issues there. So China now is, has been a really good customer. But again, as Freen has talked about before, for and past webinars with the uh, corn and so on. They, they can be a fickle customer. But anyway, our exports are booming, which is, is good news for prices as well on the demand side. So go to the next slide. Uh, here's then the feeder cattle, kind of the same thing here. The red line you see compared to the last three years right now, we're just barely above 2018, still above the last three years. The reason why we aren't as high compared to previous years as fed cattle is the higher corn prices that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, about double what they were last year, more on that in a minute, but good expectations there for feeder cattle as well. You saw our supply is going to be down this fall and fed cattle prices and, and corn are the two biggest issues that affect uh, feeder cattle prices, uh, you know, give, given the lower supplies and the fed cattle next year up at 140 is affecting that. So by the end of the year, uh, futures up there at 130 at, at, uh, at, you know, 168 and, um, you know, and then following through to next spring up there, 168 levels. And if 168 does materialize on a monthly basis, even by November of this year or into next year, those will be the highest prices since November of 2015. So a number of years back. So a lot of high expectations there. Again, things can come along and they have bombarded us the last couple of years, but now things look positive there. So go to the next slide. Again, the big issue that Frayne just got through talking about is corn, is what's corn going to do on the top. You see uh, Omaha corn prices last year at this time were $3, and now they're $6.30. So it kind of begs the question is what would feeder cattle be now if we had corn prices last year, but it's a moot point because we don't. And, and that's kind of the, what's holding them down a little bit. But again, we've got a volatile market there. You see on the bottom is November feeder cattle futures of this year versus December corn. And uh, today at 1030, we had the, uh, you know, up there at 167 on feeder cattle and on the left-hand side about 554 on corn. That was before the report came out. But then, you know, all pandemonium broke loose. Corn went up 40 cents uh, after the report came out and feeder cattle went down $3.40. And by golly, by the, uh, that was by noon. And by the end of the day, feeder cattle came back and uh, November, November feeder cattle closed at uh, up 10 cents. And corn went back down, corn still closed up 14 cents after being up 40. So just a wild, wild day. And I guess we can kind of expect that. But the big issue is, you know, as Frayne talked about is what's going to happen to the corn crop and will prices go up or down and certainly feeder cattle will respond in the opposite direction. So go to the next slide. Uh, just talk a little bit about lamb prices. Not only are cattle prices higher than they, they have been, but lamb prices are high too. Particularly slaughter lamb prices are even higher than feeder lamb prices now. And that's kind of the same issue that we are having on the beef side is the restaurants didn't have lamb. And then as the restaurants opened up, they had to restock their shelves. Our lamb crop is down. And so we have fewer lambs. And then the 
drought is bringing them to market earlier. And so lamb weights are down and, and, and so on. And so uh, slaughter lamb prices have increased and, and are even higher than feeder lamb prices, which are down around 250 compared to the 265, 70 slaughter lamb price. But again, why feeder lamb prices are lower is because of corn uh, as, as well. So go to my next slide to finish up here. Uh, Ron uh, couldn't be on today. He's having internet issues. So he gave me a call. And he was just going to talk about there's uh, a lot of interest in what's the value of standing corn for silage. I was just out in Western North Dakota, just got back. And uh, there's a lot of corn being put up into silage. Uh, I think it's right before on the east side of McKenzie, probably the highest place in North to, in Burley County right now is a big, great big silage pile of silage there that they were making when I was going by. And so a lot of questions on what's it worth and it depends on how much corn is it and so on. So uh, Ron and um, our counterpart, Zach Carlson in, in uh, Animal Science updated and, and put together a both a tool uh, that's on the website shown there that you can use to determine what the value of silage is. And then also there's a publication uh, of, of how they did it and, and, uh, and, and, and some features for adjusting the price with an estimating yield. So uh, you can use that if you want to, to determine uh, silage, which is a big thing going on. So with that, I'll quit and turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I just have a few remarks this week about uh, a few things that are going on in ethanol and then oil more broadly. Uh, there was an announcement uh, just this week of a new cellulosic ethanol refinery uh, that's planned to be built in Mason City, Iowa. Uh, construction wouldn't begin until next year, uh, but they're quite, uh, you know, more than a press release going on right now. Uh, $200 million facility, so $10 per, per gallon. Uh, which is pretty expensive. Usually it was about a dollar and a half, two dollars for a corn ethanol refinery. Uh, somewhat interestingly, they're going to be using Inbicon technology. If you remember back in North Dakota, there was a lot of discussion of building a cellulosic refinery uh, near Spiritwood, uh, where the corn ethanol refinery is, where uh, the new ADM plant is going to go, where, where Laddish uh, Cargill Malt used to be. Uh, Great River Energy, who was going to develop it, was visiting with Inbicon. That was going to be the technology that's now almost a decade ago. Uh, but this group, uh, which is based out of Pennsylvania, uh, is looking to build a, a facility in Iowa uh, now using that same technology. Uh, during the, as part of the press release, you know, they did reference a couple of things that are going on that are making uh, cellulosic investments uh, more uh, palatable, more profitable, including uh, California low carbon fuel standard, th that incentive for lower carbon fuels, which is significant. I, I don't know exactly how small of a carbon footprint uh, the fuel that this plant would make uh, would be, but I'm sure it's it's pretty close to zero. Then also there's uh, some talk about, you know, the role of the RFS. And so just double back to the RFS, renewable fuel standard, you know, we mandate different types of fuel use. Uh, and one of those is cellulosic. So it has its own bucket. Uh, and so those fuels that are eligible for that can generate D3 RINs. And if you look at that chart from Platts on the right-hand side, you can see what a, a D3 RIN has been trading for in the last uh, year, and it's over three bucks. And so that clearly there's this incentive at the federal level too, or this, this policy-based pull for cellulosic uh, fuel uh, because of the RFS, uh, in addition to whatever uh, financial incentives, you know, would be generated because of California's policy to incentivize low carbon fuels. Uh, looking at the corn ethanol crush right now, interestingly, last week, uh, USDA did not report numbers for South Dakota or Minnesota. I don't know why. Uh, so I did take Iowa, should be pretty close to what we're seeing here. Uh, uh, corn ethanol plants in Iowa last week were paying 660 a bushel, getting 215 a gallon for ethanol and 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 a dollar seventy five per ton of distillers grains. Uh, typically, I would expect that we'd be we'd be paying less for corn up here in North Dakota, but that's not the case. I did check both. I did check Blue Flint's bid right now, and they're right at that number. Uh, so they're bidding quite a bit over. Uh, and typically, you know, they we typically have lower price corn 
uh, than the rest of the country because of lack of demand. But with the short corn crop kind of going back to what Frayne was talking about, uh, you know, the, the prices are uh, are higher than you would expect them to be. And then, of course, with today's report, uh, there was that push as well. And, you know, Tim mentioned that it ended 14 cents over uh, the start of the day. Uh, ethanol prices here are also going to be a little bit less versus Iowa. Iowa's closer to Chicagoland and, you know, other uh, points of points of demand, so price would be a little less. But just looking at where I would be would be with that simple crush, and this is just doing math with those uh, inputs in terms of corn and then outputs in terms of ethanol and distillers grains, really close to that break even number. So I always use twenty five cents for the cost of uh, other operating and another twenty five cents for capital. So these these plants are, are close to breaking even. I would say that given that, I would think that most corn ethanol plants in North Dakota are. Are, are not doing quite as well, still covering operating, uh, but not not making quite as much. And of course, so much of it comes now to uh, that corn availability uh, going into harvest and then exactly how they're going to be uh, sourcing their their grain uh, for the next the next year. Uh, just kind of looking back and kind of revisiting what's gone on in, in ethanol, and then I'll look at oil as well. Uh, if we go back to the dip and so that that vertical line, it uh, goes through March of 2020, so that's about when COVID hit. And then just looking at where, uh, you know, after that point is the things we've lived in. So this is this new uh, post-COVID world uh, that we have. And then looking at where the what the level was this month versus where it was two years ago, using 2019 as saying, you know, where we think we might be. And you actually look at net input, so that's the amount of ethanol going into refineries. It's actually really close to where we were two years ago. Um, it's recovered. Uh, uh, almost completely. And in fact, if we look at, at the number above it, uh, blue line is, is domestic ethanol production. We're at over a million barrels a day. So that's about 15.3 uh, billion gallons a year, uh, which is about, uh, you know, a, a, a good a, a good amount of use for uh, corn ethanol and pretty close to where we were two years ago. And of course, we'll see what happens with continuing demand. It's almost the end of the driving season. Uh, but the economy is continuing to grow, and, and those numbers um, might see some growth. And again, we do see that announcement of that, that cellulosic plant. Uh, finally, stocks uh, on the bottom half have basically recovered and are really close to where they were uh, two years ago. And again, pre, pre-COVID, we were in a really tight range for ethanol stocks for, for four or five years. And so we're basically back to that level after just a bit of a roller coaster ride due to COVID. Uh, looking at similar things with oil production. So again, this is that same kind of map. So what happened after March 2020? So when COVID started, uh, we have not seen a, a full recovery in terms of oil production. Uh, uh, imports have, for the most part, recovered, um, but we're, we're, we're still a little bit short. Uh, gasoline supply, so the actual amount that we take to market is is has is close to recovered. So I'm imagining that we're uh, Cracking a little bit of, of jet fuel because we don't have much jet demand and, and sending that into the that retail market for gasoline. So in, in many respects, you know, that part of the, the 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 fuel market is recovered. So gasoline use, you know, passenger miles, all sorts of talks of, of folks traveling this summer, all of all of those recreational dollars going on out there. I would probably expect that to continue, if not grow, as the economy continues to rebound. Uh, one of my last comments, just kind of. Uh, springboarding off of some comments that Brian made, uh, you know, he had some really good points. I just want to talk a little bit about energy. And so energy is one of those areas where if the price of energy goes up, it does have the, 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 the potential to lift other prices because so much of our economy, you know, requires energy or is based on energy. And so right now we're still seeing some pretty high numbers. And of course, based on a year ago, you know, things are, are looking uh, as if there's extremely high levels of inflation. But again, a lot of this is it does go back to that supply demand push. We do have pretty strong demand, uh, and most importantly, you know, the supply just has not gotten back to where we expect it to be. The price of oil is high, and it's still not incentivizing that domestic production that we were hoping would come online. And so that that kind of justifies why energy is at where it is. And then also going back to Brian's point, where it could be transitory. You know, it, you know, if we you know, can increase that, that domestic oil production, we should see at least a stabilization of those oil prices. And you know, the same can be said for, for, for you, used cars and trucks. There, you know, there's been a shock there. We had a, a dump of vehicles with, with, with COVID. Uh, 
we have our, our, our circuit shortage, which is causing a lot of trouble. We have supply issues, some supply chain issues, uh, just as we're moving trucks to market or trying to finish off vehicles. And those numbers are high, but even those are already starting to plateau. Um, the thought is here again, you know, price, you know, those used car prices are likely stabilizing. They probably will decline to some extent because of how liquid that market is, but it's not going to be a dramatic decline, you know, just as Brian alluded to previously. Um, those are the comments that I had. And so that concludes uh, our prepared remarks. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, as we noted before, Frayne is, is out for now. Uh, but if you do have any questions for him, I uh, will definitely get him his way. Or if you'd like to ask him directly, you're welcome to do that as well. I just mentioned that it is the end of summer. We are going to, you know, continue the webinar series uh, for the foreseeable future, including next next month uh, in September. So, you know, we'll continue to, to have the webinars. We'll be posting uh, our, our slide decks as well as up, uh, uploading the recording webinars so you can view them at a later time. Or if you'd like to share them with one of your colleagues, you're welcome to do that as well. But if there's no more questions, the, Tim or Brian, do you have any comments? Anything that might have come to mind? Let's get some rain, but I know it's harvest too. So <laughs> kind of a catch 22. No doubt. Well, if there aren't any questions today, I want to thank uh, Tim and Brian and Frayne for, for, for presenting uh, and for all of you for attending. Uh, we'll get the, the slides up, the, the recording up in short order and let you know when they're online. And with that being done, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and weekend. Thanks. Thank you.